Welcome to the webinar, Teaching by Observation, How to Improve Resident Skills. I'm Barbara Lewis, the Managing Editor for DocCom, an online communication skills learning system for residency programs, hospitals, and medical schools offering over 40 CME credits. The webinar will last about 30 minutes, and the recording and the PowerPoint will be available on the DocCom website shortly. If you have any questions, you can type them in the chat box located in the side panel. And if we don't have a chance to answer your question during the webinar, we'll respond afterwards. Joining me today is Dr. Eric Hombo. He is the ACGMA Chief Resident Milestone Development and Evaluation Officer, Professor Adjunct of Medicine at Yale University and at the Uniform Services University and Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. He's quite busy. Previously, he was the Associate Program Director at Yale Primary Care Internal Medicine Residency Program. His research interests include interventions to improve quality of care and methods in the evaluation of clinical competence, and he has memberships in a number of organizations. Welcome, Eric. Thank you, Barbara, and thanks to everybody for joining us today. Um, what we want to do is talk a little bit about strategies and and approaches to improve direct observation and particularly the, the clinical skills of our learners. And so what I've shown on the screen here are what we kind of consider the basic clinical skills, medical interviewing, physical examinations, informed decision-making, clinical judgment and reasoning, interpersonal communication. And I've also added reflective practice because I think this is a really important clinical skill that informs our clinical reasoning practices and also helps us to connect um, to patients. And I've also put the word basic in quotes because I don't think these are so basic. I think to do them really well takes a lot of practice, a lot of coaching and development on the part of our students and residents. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about how can we assess these through observation. Next slide, please. So just a quick review, and I always like to show this because sometimes in this day and age of technology, people say like, well, do these things really still matter? And I think the good news for us is that they really do. Um, I'm sure many of you've heard the old adage that you can make a uh, proper diagnosis 80% of the time by taking a good history. Um, that's not just something somebody made up. There are several studies, some going back into the 70s, but more recent ones that have shown that, yeah, the history is still really important to making a proper diagnosis. And it's also important to make sure we're not doing unnecessary testing. The other thing we know from growing literature is that faulty data gathering, such as in history and physical examinations, can be a source of diagnostic errors. And in fact, we know that diagnostic error has become a major health issue uh, and, and often leads um, to death when it's really severe. And, and we know as part of the process that taking a good history is really important to making a proper diagnosis. Next slide. This is one of my favorite studies from a few years back done here in Chicago where they took um, 100 consecutive patients admitted to the internal medicine service. And what they were interested in was looking for a missed uh, physical um, examination or a pivotal finding that changed the nature of diagnosis or patient management. And you can see that there were 26 pivotal findings that were missed that changed the diagnosis or patient management during admission. And these were things, again, missed by the residents. It's not to in any way to mean the residents, but to point out that even again, in an age of technology, our physical exam is still really important and it often will lead to a change in diagnosis or in the way we care for patients. Next slide. We also know from a growing body of work, and I wanna give a shout out to the folks at .com here because many of the folks who participated have done this research, but patient-centered care isn't just icing on the cake or a nice thing to have. As you can see from the slide, all of these things have been associated um, when patients see physicians and healthcare professionals who have better communication skills and are more patient-centered in their approach, including improved outcome and decreased cost. We also know it improves patient well-being and improves their adherence to therapies. And we give you just a list of some of the many references that have found this connection. Next slide, please. So why is direct observation important? Well, hopefully, 
the kind of short uh, preamble around history taking, physical exam, and kind of informed decision making communication are helpful, but let's explore um, kind of three reasons why direct observation is so important. Next slide. The first is that within our training settings, we want to ensure that patients get safe, effective patient-centered care. That's the goal. And so we always have to keep that, that end goal in mind, that ultimately it's about the patient. You know, and our training programs need to center their education and clinical care around the patient. And so observation is the way to make sure that happens. Next slide. So what do we know about the state of clinical skills? And unfortunately, this work goes back a number of years and continues to be a challenge for us. But we've known for a long time that there's wide variability in graduating students' clinical skills. Either measured during their fourth year or starting internship, there have been a number of studies that, for example, have used an OSCE, standardized patient assessment, during orientation prior to starting internship around some of these basic skills. And we've continued to struggle with this. We also know, however, that practicing physicians often have variability in their skills. And there's several important articles, for example, that show that faculty often don't have better physical exam skills, for example, in cardi uh, cardiac auscultation skills than third year medical students. That's with Condiments Criley's article. And we also know that many practicing physicians don't practice uh, you know, fully effective informed decision making, and that's work that's been done in the past by people like Wendy Levinson and Clarence Braddock. So we know that despite the importance of these skills, there's still a fair amount of variability. Next slide. So if we come back to this kind of earlier slide, if the goal is safe, effective, patient-centered care, how do we get there in the context of training? Well, obviously we want to make sure our trainees can provide the kind of care that's needed for the patient and their performance, which is a function of their level of competence and development occurring within a context such as where that care is being provided, has to be integrated with the appropriate level of supervision. So the attending and other faculty need to understand where the trainee is developmentally in order to add, if you will, or contribute the appropriate level of supervision to ensure that every patient coming into a training clinic or hospital is getting safe, effective patient-centered care. And what does a faculty member need in order to make those supervision decisions? Well, they have to watch. They have to watch what the trainee can do through direct observation to see where they are developmentally so that they can appropriately adjust their type of supervision to enable that ultimate goal of safe, effective patient-centered care. Next slide. The other thing that's important to remember, and I've just shown this up, this is a wonderful article from Martin Pusik, really showing what the kind of developmental trajectory looks like for a resident. Learning curves are not nice, you know, 45 degree linear lines. They're sigmoidal. And we have to remember that when our residents come into our program, they're coming in if we're lucky as advanced beginners. Remember, they've only spent up to 20 weeks within their particular specialty by the time they start their internship during medical school. And so they're going to spend their time with you climbing this steep curve. And our goal is to get them to proficiency. And so in order to track this development and to make sure we're keeping them on the right trajectory, you have to look. And that's where, again, observation is so important. Next slide. So we like to show this slide. This is work that i um, been doing with Jen Kogan at Penn, who's just one of my heroes and has really been leading a lot of our workshop, uh, I'm sorry, research and workshops in collaboration with Lisa Conforti, another one of my heroes. But we like to show this slide and ask this question, what do they have in common? Well, you'd probably go like, well, they all make a lot of money. Yeah, that's true. Um, and that they're all really, really good at what they do. Yeah, that's true as well. Um, but they also had something else in common. They all have coaches, right? As good as they are, they still have people helping them to continually get better. Next slide. And so one of the ways that they're able to reach this amazing level of expertise and maintain and continue to grow is through this uh, process of deliver practice. This is wonderful work from Anders Erickson and many others about the importance of engaging in delivered practice. And if you haven't read uh, Anders book, Peak, um, which is a really nice synopsis of his work, I would strongly recommend it. But deliberate practice 
requires two things. First, you have to have a field that's reasonably well developed. That means you have to have clear mental representations or shared mental models of the task of that field. And so all the clinical skills I talked about earlier are those really, really important tasks or skills in order to care for patients. And the question is, do we have good shared mental models or representations of what excellence or expertise looks like in those clinical skills? Because without that, it is tough for the teacher to provide the right practice activities and informative feedback to help learners improve their performance. You have to have the mental representation of shared or shared mental model first in order to provide those activities and feedback. So these two things are critical to deliberate practice. Next slide. And the other article I'd really encourage you to take a look at is, is from Atul Gawande. This is called Personal Best, published in the New Yorker in 2011. And he talked about how he brought in one of his former mentors to watch him during surgery because he noticed that his morbidity statistics had kind of plateaued a bit. And he said, huh, why am I not getting better? Yes, compared to others, I'm doing okay. But why am I not getting better? And so that person came in and gave him some feedback. And as you can see from the article, what he said was they observe, they judge, and they guide. That one 20 minute discussion gave me more to consider and work on than I've had in the past five years. He also goes on to say, I had no outside ears or eyes to help me. In other words, the coach. And the coach gave him lots of little refinements, very much along the lines of deliberate practice that enabled him to continually get better as a surgeon. Next slide. The other thing is that if you think about um, the importance of observation for you know, coaching and feedback, I love to throw up these kind of two images. Again, this comes from Jen. But imagine if Michelle Kwan you know, came into practice one day and put on her skates and she walks down to the hall and her coach is sitting in a separate office with the door closed, having a cup of coffee. And he says, listen, Michelle, I want you to go out and basically, why don't you do about five triple axles? And if you can throw in a quadruple lutz, that would be great. And, and then maybe skate around some figure eights. And then I want you to come back and tell me how it went. You'd all recognize that as crazy. The only way to really help Michelle get better is you have to watch as she does all those things. And back in the 1970s, one of my heroes, George Engel, the kind of the father of the biopsychosocial model, likened medical education is if we send somebody down the hall to play a musical instrument and then come back and tell us how it sounded. Again, making the argument that if you're going to coach and provide high quality feedback, you have to look and you have to watch. Next slide. Really an important third reason for direct observation is we're moving to this competency-based model. As you can see from this wonderful cartoon, um, we're trying to move away from this over-reliance on just structure and process and dwell time to really look at an outcome measured through the competencies. You know, as this cartoon says, I taught Stripe how to whistle. I don't hear him whistling. I said I taught him. I didn't say he learned it. And so we're really trying to be sure that we're clear on what it is our learners can do. And that's the educational outcomes that we're now really focused on. And for those of you working with milestones, the milestones are really designed to be a narrative way to think about those developmental outcomes with our, our residents and fellows. Next slide. So I would make the argument it's very difficult to effectively teach what you do not assess. We often look at curriculum and assessment as these kind of separate things. In reality, they drive each other. We know from lots of work around the learning cycle or learning loops that assessment is a critical part of learning. It's not a one-off. Unfortunately, in medicine, we tend to hang the garlic, put up the horseshoe, whatever you want to choose, because we don't feel comfortable. Most of us don't wake up every morning and go like, ah, I am so excited. I can't wait because I get to assess a bunch of students and residents today. And that's unfortunate because assessment is so important to learning and direct observation is such an important tool to help us do that. Next slide. And the other way to think about it is that observation really sits at the top of what's known as the Miller Pyramid. George Miller wrote this in 1990 and what he points out is that all the stuff below that are kind of measures of capacity and capability, but ultimately we want to know what they can do. That's a key outcome. And it has to be done at least you know, uh, predominantly along with other tools through faculty observation. Next slide. And we have to remember that if we think of that pyramid as the tip of the spear, going back to the earlier kind of equation I showed you, 
Uh, we have to remember that it's the patient who's at the tip of that spear. And we have to use observation to make sure they get that safe, effective patient-centered care and to make sure that we're helping our learners appropriately develop. Next slide. So as we think about direct observation, what are some of the barriers? You know, what gets in the way of us doing frequent high quality direct observation? And the first I'll just put out there is time. Time's a big issue. Next slide. And so you can see we put that right at the top. There's no question that it takes some time to do this. But also there's sometimes a lack of buy-in. People don't think it's important. Or like, you know, I turned out okay and I was never observed, so I don't really think I need to do it. There's a concern that undermines the learn to patient relationship. And there are ways to get around that. There are ways to actually create, if you will, an alliance with the patient within the learning uh, community uh, and the learning environment that actually works quite well. And I think if you set up the observation effectively, this actually isn't a big issue. Um, you know, one thing I always point out to folks that patients know they're seeing a learner. And when I've talked with them in my past uh, work, they've often said like, listen, we're really ha happy that somebody's quote, minding the store, if you will. And they're often actually really pulling for their, or their resident or fellow, you know, like, hey, please give them a good grade. I really want them, you know, I really like them and, and things like that. So I think there are ways to manage this. And then the other is just low self-efficacy. I'm not, you know, I'm being asked to assess something that I don't feel that I'm, I'm good at. The example I often use is um, the thyroid exam, where I just, I wasn't good at it. I really needed some additional training after residency. I don't know what the standards are. I'm not quite sure how to give good feedback. And then if I identify a problem, I'm not quite sure what action plan I can offer them. So these are some major barriers among faculty. Next slide. These are reasons that learners don't buy in. They recognize faculty are busy, which is kind of interesting. So they're reticent to ask. It is anxiety provoking, particularly if it's done infrequently. The more infrequent you do it, the more anxiety and high stakes it feels to learn. And research is pretty clear on that. It can feel artificial if it's done poorly, or if it's just a checkbox activity, like, yeah, yeah, I have to get this done. I know, you know, Dr. Sons has to check it off. If you don't have a longitudinal relationship, trust can be tough to build. And it can threaten autonomy and efficiency if it's done poorly. And as I mentioned earlier, is it really for feedback or am I actually getting a grade? Is this really a high stakes assessment? All these things come into play. Next slide. We also know that assessment quality can be poor. And a lot of times faculty may not attend to the right things or they look at different aspects of performance and that can be quite variable. They may have unclear or different expectations about what is acceptable. And therefore the learner, it's, it's very confusing. Like, well, Dr. Homo said, this is okay, but Dr. X doesn't think that's okay. And I'm not quite sure what to do with that. And then we know rating errors are pretty common. Uh, one of the big issues for us in medicine is halo effect. If they're really nice or perceived to be smart, then it quote spills over into everything else. We rate everything high. Horn effect, which is the opposite is unusual. Some of our faculty are just lenient or doves. Uh, we have some hawks, uh, that's the stringency effect and they're less common. And then we all have a, a series of cognitive biases that come into play that can affect our ratings. Next slide. The other thing that I, I think probably we need to spend more attention on, and again, this is where tools like doc.com uh, doc can be helpful. Um, is this, is that the faculty's primary frame of reference for judging clinical skills is self. Um, now, that's okay under the following two conditions. Self is competent and self can describe what competent is. And so what we've learned, if you think back to an earlier slide, there is this variability challenge among faculty. And so the elephant in the room um, may be our own, our own skills. Next slide. And as it turns out, yeah, that is an issue. There's a series of studies that have shown that our own clinical skills can be variable and even deficient in all of these areas. And this is just a whole series of articles over the years highlighting that point, you know, that we all struggle with this. And part of it is many of us and myself included, by the way, were just never well trained. These are things that I had to pick up after I finished residency. And don't get me wrong, I love my residency, but in retrospect, I really wish I had had more time working on some of these uh, areas that I just didn't get a lot of uh, coaching at the bedside. Next slide. And to further highlight that, this is a study that Jen Kogan and I did 
where um, as part of having them rate a series of videos and two live scripted encounters where we learned about this self as the primary frame of reference, we had them undergo an OSCE, an eight station OSCE in the morning. Uh, we stripped out things that were not essential to making the diagnosis. So we use kind of a key features approach. And you can see in the screen among these 44 faculty what the range of performance was. And let me point something out. These are people who volunteered to do this study. And at the end of the day, to their credit, you know, many of them said, like, you know, I have to be honest with you, I'm not sure I'm good at some of this. For example, we had a breaking bad news station. I don't know if I'm doing it well. I was never really taught a formal way to do it. And so many of them really reflected on their own struggles in some of the areas that they didn't feel comfortable. And yet they said, we're being asked to assess this. Next slide. And what we also found in that study, interestingly, is that those who did the best in the OSCE um, also were more likely to be stringent and provide lower ratings. And by the way, appropriately lower ratings in those videos in the afternoon. When we put in their performance on the OSCE into a multivariate equation, it was the only thing that correlated with their mini CEX ratings. Their years of experience, their gender, the particular rank, their role all washed out. It really was all based on, on their clinical skills from the OSCE in the morning. Next slide. The other thing that I hope by now has kind of become clear is that we can create forms that are helpful, but they're not the magic bullet. Assessment requires faculty training. And we now look at direct observation, uh, faculty development, direct observation is a, is a twofer. Um, you know, how do we help people solidify their skills, recognize areas that they themselves might benefit from learning some of these frameworks? And what's critical is we've learned from our work, given how important self is as a frame of reference, is that we have to develop these shared mental models. And so we need to use the evidence we have, and you hear a little bit more about that from Barbara in a minute, um, about you know, making sure people have robust mental models around effective clinical skills. And we have a lot of evidence now about what that is. And by doing that, it also help us move to more of a criterion reference type assessment, which is gonna be essential to teaching and assessing clinical skills, but also essential for good coaching and feedback. Next slide. And so one of the techniques we use and I encourage you to think about it is performance dimension training. I love this cartoon. This is again from Chen, where they're all looking at corner and at the end the dog goes like, what the hell are we looking at? And that's the whole problem. If we don't have a shared mental model, and we're all using different criteria on which to judge a performance and not using the best evidence, then it's very confusing. It can be very heterogeneous in exactly what it is we're paying attention to. Next slide. So one of the techniques that we've now studied in a number of um, research um, uh, projects is something called performance dimension training. This actually comes out of organizational psychology and really the whole purpose of a performance dimension training exercise is to think about a competency in behavioral terms, like taking a history or doing informed decision making, and really developing robust criteria and qualifications for proficiency and expertise in that competency. It turns out that conversation helps to develop a shared mental model, and you can incorporate the evidence into that conversation to help people develop these more robust skills and mental models around these clinical skills. We've also learned that simply handing somebody a framework without having them struggle with it a bit actually is less effective. That just getting a group together for a 15 minute conversation, have them struggle a little bit and, and through group process develop their initial mental model, then sharing uh, some of the evidence-based models can be actually a very powerful technique to improve their observation skills. And also they've told us it helps them in their own clinical skills when they care for their, their patients. Next slide. And so this is really what we're trying to move away from, that you know, what I do or normative to more of a criterion reference that is grounded in safe, effective patient-centered care that better prepares people to be ready for unsupervised practice, because that's what we're all really shooting for. Next slide. And you know, one of the ways to do that is getting back to the kind of time barriers, use snapshots. You know, you don't have to watch um, every visit from start to end. You know, you could watch snapshots. Maybe today, just watch the history. So for example, everybody in clinic, if you're in a primary care specialty, has a first visit of the day. 
go watch one of them, just one, and maybe watch them just do the history taking. Or after they've come and signed them out, go back and do some physical exam or say to them, listen, after you do the history, I, kind of, I want to come watch you do the physical exam. Or go back and join them for the informed decision making. So you can use this concept of snapshots and watch things in small aliquots of times, and that can be very effective. Next slide. Just real quickly, I just want to make you aware of some of the resources. We do run assessment courses here in Chicago. We'd love to have those of you who want to come out. It's really designed to help you build programs of assessment. Um, and as part of that week-long course, we have a fair amount of work and direct observation, including a half day in the simulation lab over at Northwestern, where you get to practice direct observation with a standardized resident and standardized patient. We're also using this training technique in a growing number of regional hubs where they, these are um, at institutions that are providing a shorter version of this course, particularly for frontline faculty, your core faculty and clinician educators, um, and that includes the direct observation training. And if you go to our website and click on the courses tab, you can see what courses are available. We also have a assessment 101 15 minute module on our milestones homepage that you can use with your faculty. And we're finishing a randomized controlled trial in trying to use spaced online learning for direct observation. And we hope to have the results in 2020 and also create a toolkit for all of you that you can use to help your faculty get better um, at direct observation. And if there's anything else that we can help with, please let me know. I'm, I'm happy to follow up with folks and tell you more about some of our other resources. Next slide. And with that, thank I'm going to turn it over to Barbara. Yeah, thank you, Eric. That was just terrific and really very persuasive to teach by observation. It was uh, excellent. Thank you so much for that. And we'll have Eric's email address at the end here, as well as a way that you can get a uh, trial subscription to .com. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about .com. We have 42 online modules, each about an hour in length, and we have over 40 CME credits, uh, over 400 realistic and unscripted videos, and annotated videos as well, and lots of faculty resources. So all our modules are the same. They're very consistent across the format. And the rationale, we start with rationale, key concepts, learning goals, and behavioral checklists and lots of references. So we started annotating our videos a couple of years ago, which again, our learners really like a lot, where it is highlighted what the person is doing, the clinician is doing here, name and legitimizing the emotion. And then if you click on the icon, out pops the clinician talking about what's going on in the back of his head. We have comprehension scores, such as this one, where the learner goes through and, and checks off where an empathic comment should be made and then see how they score. And I've taken this several times, and each time I get better at recognizing where an empathic comment should be made. And some of our subscribers are using this as, as uh, predicting who needs remediation. Uh, we did a before and after .com use with uh, one of our subscribers. And uh, in that empathy understanding, before .com, they scored 41%, and after .com, 96%. And then we did the multiple choice delta between before .com and after, averaging about 30 or 40% change in the, in the scores. So we have a lot of free resources for you. We have uh, webinars such as this. We have about 20 of them on various subjects. We, mentioned here breaking bad news we have one on delivering bad news which is one of our modules and uh, we have a podcast of 25 minutes each 16,000 have been downloaded so far and we have over 70 episodes and eric has been interviewed on one of those as well so if you want more information you can listen to his podcast uh, for more information you can contact me at b lewis at .com.org for a one month free trial subscription. And we have a number of our residency programs that are assigning .com prior to orientation and uh, having their uh, interns uh, watch .com and watch the videos. So here is Eric's email address as well. I wanted to uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. We had a record number sign up. 
Uh, the recording and the PowerPoint will be available on our website very shortly. Once again, thank you, Eric, for this very important information. Yeah, thank you. And please feel free to follow up with me if you have any questions. Yeah, we didn't have any questions. So if you do, though, you can reach out to Eric. Uh, thank you, everyone, very much.